<laughs> Welcome to the Scuttlebutt. I'm Rich. And I'm Sandy from Trapping Inc. TV. And we are sitting in the very comfortable, finished room of uh, Silver Weller Taxidermy with our good friend Curtis Fisher. And uh, Curtis, thank you very much. You uh, were kind enough to offer your home and your family and and a knowledge of the area so that I could hunt moose this weekend. So. Yep. Thank, Thank you very coming. much. Yeah, it's it's good when we get to do this. We came down here and deer hunted. I hesitate to say how long ago it was, but it was nine years ago. Mm-hmm. And then you guys came up and did a little um, uh, cow elk hunting at our place a few years later. And we shouldn't leave it four or five years in between seeing each other in these kinds of circumstances anymore. But it's been a fun weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the best part about it is that you get to go see a different part of, in, there, in this case, our own home province. Yes. And and the area here is, is very different than what we've got back home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah very different. And you've got, got lots and lots of animals. It's it's funny because this is uh, considered prairie parkland. It's fairly open. And yet there's lots of moose. Yeah. But it's the, surprising how many moose there are. But you've got all of that, that scrub aspen, you know, yes. that the, the poplar or whatever you want to call it. But the scrub aspen that is everywhere out there and it it doesn't support anything it wouldn't support forestry it wouldn't only thing it supports is moose and it does a good job and some deer and and some firewood yeah Yeah. (laughs) i suppose yeah yeah Yeah. so anyway you got to got to finish this morning with uh we've we've made a tv show out of it you're you're going to see all of the all the excitement Mm -hmm. it was uh over and done the this morning first thing it was very fast yesterday we spent a lot of time uh, driving from one spot to another, and we saw lots of moose. Um, saw a couple cow calf pairs, and that was, you know, obviously we're not hunting those. We're up for a bull, and we saw a few, but they were either in the wrong spot or too far away, or moving too quick, or whatever the case may be. So we got up this morning, had breakfast, or headed. Well, I came upstairs, and I said, "Well, we're going to shoot a moose today," and. Curtis said, are we? And I said, oh, yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. And we did. So we that actually was good. Le- left the driveway, and, and your, your place is in the zone that her moose tag is. We left the driveway exactly at legal light this yes. morning. And was it three minutes or four minutes later? It yeah. wasn't very long. It wasn't past, <laughs> it wasn't past four minutes. No, I don't think so. We saw a cow with two calves cross the road in front of us and Curtis is driving. I'm sitting in the in the passenger seat. He's looking to see if he could see where those cow and calf went. And I punched him in the shoulder and went, there, <laughs> on his side of the truck. And there was a bull standing there. Well, you got to understand, too, this is ranch land. So what you're calling a road, most people would call a two-track alongside of a fence. That's true. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was very fortunate. And uh, we just bumped him out of his bed, I think. Cause yeah, we, literally. It, yeah. it snowed a little bit last night. And, and uh, I walked back to, to see where, <clears throat> where you hit him with the shot and all that. And, and to watch the blood trail and all that, because that's just the way I'm wired. And I, I go back there, and, and uh, you can see right where he stood up out of his bed. You, you practically laid him right back down into his bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well... This is kind of reminisce because when we do podcasts, we do it in front of a whole bunch of taxidermy that's in our house that you've done. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Now, how long have you been doing taxidermy? Well, I always dabbled with it when I was a kid. Did yeah. you? Yeah. Do so you have any pictures or no, examples? No, they'd be, they'd be like <laughs> plaque mounts for the neighbors, like their deer plaques. Do that. And then I think it was 96 when I attempted my first deer head. Uh-huh. And, of course, didn't look great. And, and then just kept at it. And, and I guess, had a part-time business. You know, tried to make the business go. Right. Yeah. And finally, it was in 2007. I was fortunate enough to meet uh, a very knowledgeable person in the industry. Uh-huh. And he took me in under his wing. Uh, and... uh Showed me a lot of the ropes. Right. And just gave a different perspective on, you know, how to learn it. You know, like, you know, how to how to read reference, how to look at an eyeball, and how to determine that, and then put it in the mount, right? Oh, okay. So that guy helped me out. And then he got, and then a couple of years later, he got me into competing. Right. And then 
you know, at those competitions, there's world champion, national champion judges. And I mean, it's nerve wracking. <laughs> well, uh, let, <clears throat> let's go back right to the beginning. Like you, what made you want to do and what did you start by doing? I don't, I can't remember. I just always liked seeing it. Right. You know, so then my dad built a little workbench for me in our basement and that's, I just had my own work area. And so I jigsaw out the, the plaques for the deer and. Oh, and you'd mount the. Mount them and do a little horn. felt cover. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and looking back, I mean, I still have a couple of them. Yeah. <laughs> looking back, I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> but. And well, it just, and I just starts somewhere, well, right? I don't know if it was the taxidermy, more the, the craft and art side of it and creativity. You know, you can be creative with it. So okay. you get a deer, you know, like back then, well, you do a deer and put a, like a red felt over it. And well, let's see what a black felt will look like. And it just, you're able to just. Oh, you were imaginative. Red or black. <laughs> you know, but you were able to just. Uh, play with things. Play with things. Yeah. Right? And, and then as well, I mean, of course, you're interested in hunting. Yes. And you're doing kind of an art side of it with something you're interested in. I know yes. how it would be for me, you know, because it did cross my mind briefly once for three or four seconds one day was that I could do all my own taxidermy. And man, could I have a lot? <laughs> when was this? Oh, I realized right away I had no ability. <laughs> I'm like, huh. Besides, all it takes is money. That's easy. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great to have a mentor, though, when you're starting out and, and wanting to learn something. And it is... Um, it is a, very much an art form. It's, yep. you know, I mean, to to put together the habitats, to to think of, you know, how how something is going to be mounted, whether it's going to be a shoulder mount, a pedestal mount, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that a lot of people rely on you and your judgment to make recommendations for yep. that particular animal, whatever it is, right? And yep. wherever their space is in their home or office or what have you. I was very lucky to find that mentor. Yes. And I just... I kept knocking on doors like, you know, you'd know somebody's work and then you'd go say, hey, do you mind if I hang out with you for, and, and lots of times, I mean, no. Yeah. Sorry. Trade really? secrets. Yep. Trade really? secrets. Yeah. It would be, yep. And just the one time it was the internet and this guy had done a wonderful piece, but I was more intrigued about the habitat. Right. And so I just sent him a message and said, hey, do you put on courses? He says, I don't put on courses and I don't give schools, but I don't keep secrets either. Oh. Give me a call. Oh. <laughs> and he invited me to stay at his place. And wow, I mean, and just went up there and learned habitat and just got a different, you know, there's more to this than what I already know. Right. And he opened that door up. Yeah. And then he got me into the competing side of it. Which and opens then, more doors. Well, and it just kept opening doors like... um you know, not necessarily him, but another world champion guy, you know, I mean, you, you do a mount or whatever. And, uh, and then afterwards you go get critiqued on it. Right. And yeah. you're, just, you're just fretting this critique because they're <laughs> going to rip your piece apart. Right. Basically, you know, in words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember the first competition I went to and I, I didn't sleep, you know, I was dreading it <laughs> and I did, I did a little red Fox. Right. And, you know, foxes and cats are some of the harder ones. Like, yep. our, our canines and cats are some yep. of the harder ones to do. Yep. Of course, I, that's the first thing I pick for a competition mount. And so we drove 10 hours down. It was in Montana. Went through the mountains in a, like, blizzard. And got there. You were there, determined to get there. <laughs> got there, and I walk into the showroom with my fox, and there's a half-mount elephant standing there. <laughs> <laughs> here's like, my fox here's my fox <laughs> <laughs> so you know it was exactly my first competition it was this gorgeous elephant well, and and the guy the taxidermist himself had shot it and did it you know in the backside did this whole big cave scene and really and uh you know and, and i i actually placed okay but at the critique, the judge says, you did it all wrong. <laughs> you <know? laughs> if you have time. All wrong? Yeah. If, if, you, if you have time, come by my shop and we'll show you what you did wrong. Oh, you know? cool. 
And but wow. I had won an award for that fox. I won a fur bearing award, like the best fur bear for the competition. So right. you know, I I, so I wasn't I wasn't totally <laughs> deflated. <laughs> I had a win, but I mean, how would you have felt if you showed up with a half mount elephant? And there was already one there. You couldn't couldn't win first break place for half mount elephant, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you know, and then I, I at that competition, you, I met another guy there, and and he he was a little deflated on how he did. Mm-hmm. And then the next year we went back and competed. And I re- once I re- went there for the first time, I realized, you know, you got to have that half mount elephant. It, you know, you got to knock it out of the park, right? So yeah. I had to come back with something totally different, something that was a wow factor. And uh, what was it? And it was that uh, longhorn steer uh, looking like it was getting roped. Yes. And we won a lot of awards with that. No so, kidding. So it was, it, that was... But that same guy that was that I'd met the next year, uh, he come back and he didn't do very well with a, a white tail again, and he was mad. And then he just said, "I don't know why I'm gonna, you know, I don't know why I do this." And he left. And I never seen him at a competition again. Really? So it's a mindset, right? It you is. Learn from yeah. losing and. <laughs> well, you know, I think we, there's a lot to that. We talked about that just around kids and sports and that kind of thing, but it holds true for adults as well. Like you, you have to see yourself as a winner, I think. And there's some losing or there's some lessons along the way. But Mm -hmm. if you, if you always have that further vision and a mindset that you're already there, I think you, that's what helps you get there. Oh, I, I'm a firm believer in learning by losing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, in, in, in that piece that we've won all the awards with, like, you know, the next year we didn't win awards, you know, like, right. Cause someone else came with a better piece and right. Right. You know, and so and, it should be though. And there, and there are a lot of good taxidermists like, and, and when you basically step in the ring with them, yep. you know, sometimes you're going to get your butt handed. To you. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's fascinating though, because there's, there's so many different layers or levels that are in, uh, layers is a better term. To taxidermy, I mean, right down to, to, to the pickle and the tanning and all that. That's all the basics. You know, you're, you're, you're building that foundation and everything. But then there's the, the, then there's actually the, the perfect confirmation, getting the animal right and making it look right. You know, how many of us have seen, you know, where the eyes don't look the same place and, or, or, you know. The, the, or the wrong of, eyes are in. Yeah. yeah we yeah. have one of those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not one of yours. I'll no. just make that very clear. <laughs> the guy yeah. had no clue, put the wrong, the, yeah. the, the wrong species of eyes. And, and you know all that and then you have to do the artistic part yeah. like a good piece of taxidermy looks alive yeah well you that know? that mentor you know he he wouldn't i mean he would sit and tell you how to do something but he would say it in a way that you'd have to think about it and then you'd get it right i don't know what, he just had the ability to to just put it in your brain and then you'd think about it so he just said, your animals have to look like they're doing something, whether it's a shoulder mount. Yes. Like if it's, if it's a straight on deer, mm-hmm. you know, in, in an alert pose, it right. needs to look alert. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, stuff like that. And, right, and when you stop and think about it, you know, you're laying in bed thinking about it. Well, yeah. You know, you can't have a full upright alert pose and relaxed ears. It doesn't right. make sense. Nope. Yes. Yeah. That's you know, right. That- that's all that confirmation, right? Right. And and he was and but he said it in like one phrase that you just got it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like And then so there's I the was, habitat piece too, right? Yep. Yeah. So and then at the at the competitions they have seminars. Like these um you know, world champion guys and, and all that. They'll put on seminars. And so there's no secrets, you know. And there's one guy that has a habitat, he builds the rocks, like the and you have to make the rocks, but he builds the material for it. Well, they'll put on seminars, right? So I think we've taken six or seven seminars from the same guy at the competitions. You know, and there's, cool. every year there's just a different technique or they, you know, they a might twist. build it. But during the whole year, they're they're playing with it. Yes. Then they come back to the competition and they tell you how to do it. Of course, you know, you're going to buy the rock. Right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's their benefit too. But so, um, yeah, it's just an open mindset of well, taxi- wanting to learn. Taxi today though has hit a whole new level. 
you go to the competitions or you go to SCI mm -hmm. and see the taxidermy there. And, you know, there's there's a, uh, an elephant pirouetting off the top of a zebra, you know. Or, <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's usually a leopard hang or leopard or something hanging off the side of a buffalo, you know. It's just like... You just your your breath taken. You you did you did uh, a piece with a uh, I believe it was a mule deer with with two uh, yeah we did two a, cougars. We did a leaping mule deer. Yeah, um, fully suspended, so nothing was touching the ground. Yeah, and then the cougar fully suspended underneath it, hanging off it. Yeah, and then another big tom coming in behind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, that's amazing. Nobody dreamt of that stuff. No, you know, I mean we're in a lot of ways we're in the golden age of yeah. taxidermy. Well. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it has, the mindset has opened up Yeah. to the art side of it, not just a stuffed deer on the wall. <laughs> well, here's, here's a story that talks about, how, you know, that really talks about taxidermy. We were in Africa and mm -hmm. we went into this little museum and it was about one of their ancestors and he was a great. We were at Amakala Game Reserve okay. and, and we'd gone to this, um, there was a, a, where the women um, of the community would get together and and they had a store there that would sell their wares. But right on the same property then was a... This was little museum. This museum. And this guy had been a great uh, lion and leopard hunter. And, you know, he because it was back in the in the dark days of, of Africa, that was very important. These animals killed uh, uh, not only um, the, the cattle and the, and the sheep and the goats and all that, but they, they killed humans. Mm -hmm. And... He had all of them. He was also an amateur taxidermist. So back then he would, it was probably with, you know, lime and straw and that kind of stuff was what they were all stuffed with. And they looked like that. Mind you, they're 150 years old at this point, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of them. Oh, yeah. He'd there. done a lot of them. And most of them were cut like right off at the base of the neck. So it was just basically his head on the wall. And then the one of, one lion there, though, had... had well, they were uh, they all had their, uh, their mouths open. Well, that's what I'm trying to... Oh, okay. Where I was going was the one lion had its mouth closed. And then there's a story below it. This lion killed his favorite dog. So being disrespectful for it, he, 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 <laughs> he mounted it with its mouth closed. <laughs> you know, was, you know that, that was their idea. It was payback. Of, that was payback. And that yeah. was, and that was uh, you know, what taxidermy was back then. And every one of them had the same, you know, like they, they were a snarl like, or an open mouth or, or something. Or they had a bad dip of skull or something. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? but this one had its mouth just yeah. totally sealed shut and it was an obvious like it was so obvious in the room yeah. that was you know all around the room were these were these head Lep mounts leopards and, and lions yeah yep and only one of them had its mouth closed <laughs> so, they've, so they've, it's cool we've changed so far oh, and yeah. i mean when i look at the animals and 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 uh, you know how the poses you have them in Probably the, the the ones that have the least amount of, of possibilities are the African stuff, right? Like when we look at our elk, I mean, how many different poses is there for an elk or a caribou or, or a deer, right? You know, mm -hmm. there's sneak poses and turns and pedestals and all that. But a lot of the African doesn't have that support, does it? Um, I would say 10 years ago, no. no. Now they're, it depends on the animal. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Like for example, a kudu. Yeah. You can get a lot of different forms. Okay. And... Uh, it and seemed that's to be probably a whole, just demand now. <clears throat> it seemed to be a hole in the market mm -hmm. for that. You know, there was just left and right turn forms. Right. And now, now there's pedestals and and the you know you got your certain animals that don't. You yeah. know, they, there's only six or eight forms. Yeah. But you know, almost every catalog offers a kudu form in you know a dozen different poses. So, well, that's okay. cool. But that being said, you know, to the um, artistic side, you can make it what you want it with, with, uh, um, you can alter it and, and turn it into that piece. Well, you're, you're saying that up here, you've got a coyote that, that, uh, you actually shot and it was a very large coyote. There wasn't a, a form for it and uh, you wanted a home on it. So you, you did a body molding yeah. of it. Yeah. We made a body cast of it. Yeah. And then it was an old coyote that, um, had worn out teeth. And I I wanted to use those teeth, but I still wanted the the euro, the skull, to show people. Right? right. So we made a cast of his teeth. Yeah. And then and then made the cast and put it in the mount. So he's got a exact replica of his teeth. I know you wow. did a, an otter for me, a river otter, and it was an enormous otter. Mm -hmm. You had to you had to body mold it as well. Yep. It was a thirty four pound otter. That's just gigantic, right? Yeah. <laughs> that yep. was way bigger than any anything you're you're going to be able to get for a mount. Yep. Yep. And I always give credit to the guy that, you know, my, the mentor that, you know, nothing's impossible. 
Right. Right. You know, you can There's make a it. way that you can figure yeah. it out. If they don't have it, make it. Yes. And uh, so, and he, and I asked him one time, like, I said, why do you, why do you tell people your secrets? <laughs> and he said, I can tell you anything I want. He says, whether you can do it or not. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and so that, that was like, it was a bit, okay, well, this is a challenge and, or, <laughs> and, and a little bit of uh, uh, encouragement. Yes. You know? So mm-hmm. it, it was like, wow, the door is still open. Yeah. I can learn this. And, and so. We just... I think that's how it, a lot of things evolve, though, is this sharing of information. And the same mm-hmm. thing happens with trapping. Oh, right? yeah. Yep. Um, you know, years and years ago, a lot of the old trappers didn't get to get together, right? There was no real sharing of information because everybody lived in vastly different areas and there wasn't a place to congregate together. Yep. But now we've got the Internet, for one. Yep. And in Alberta, we've got a very active trapping association so there were we have thousands upon thousands of emails and letters and messages and you name it Mm -hmm. that all say that you you guys don't you're not secretive you tell all all the secrets and why not well i think you've said it best on many on many occasions like those people aren't going to trap where where we trap nope. mm-hmm. and we're not going to trap where they trap but it's not a it's not a competition you've probably way. heard stories where somebody has a hard time catching wolves yep yes. you get a couple tips and secrets and all of a sudden they're catching wolves right yeah. yes and that's to everybody's betterment yep. right you know absolutely yeah absolutely T- because trapping is never going to survive based on somebody making money off of catching fur it's going to survive based on being that buffer between animals and civilization and there's probably a lot of old knowledge that needs to be passed on there is a lot of old knowledge and i and we're losing it year after year with a lot of our senior trappers who haven't been able to tell their stories or or they don't have family that have carried on traditions there may be bachelor folks or their families never continued on or what have you i mean we've got some friends like that yep right so Hmm. um it's really important that that you have another generation of people that can share it. And the TV show has been a really good way to share information. Been wonderful. It, yeah. it, 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 based on how I actually started it, kind of looking for a fight, it, it's become this, <laughs> this, this <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> yeah, this wonderful uh, group hug w- within a community. It's been, it's been a, a hoot. It's, it's and surprising oh. how well it's connected people together. Yep. Right. Yep. So, do you have a favorite animal or technique? I do like mounting antelope. Antelope, pronghorn. Yep. yep, they're just the pretty animal. Yep. They, they are. That hair, though, is like got to be the hardest hair you ever worked. It's with. not fun. No, no. But on a good tan, it it's fine. Yeah, yeah. You just got to be a little careful skinning them. But they're just everyone actually is really unique. When you get them all up on the wall, like if you get 20 of them up on the wall, you know, there's some more orange, there's different hair patterns. and Oh, and yeah. They're just, yeah, big eyebrow, big eyelashes. And, <laughs> and you know, you can, same thing, make them do something. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So well, they're a very curious animal. Yeah. You can make them look curious or make them look like they're going to square off or chase another antelope. And, you know, so it's pretty, I like them. And whitetails are fun. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You do a lot of whitetail? Do a lot of whitetails, yep. Um, mule deer, I, 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 I think I've picked the animals based on uh, their colors and, you know, like a whitetail has got, like, I think nice hair. You right. Know, like, um, where a mule deer to me is just a gray animal. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> and, I mean, I, I, I'll, I like doing them, but if I had to pick, I would do whitetails over mule deer. Yeah. Because I, I like how they turn out. I just think they're pretty animals. You do yeah. a lot of African now. Yep. Yeah. That was with you guys, you know. When we you started. Guys, yeah. I don't know how long ago we did that. We started. Uh, well, our first trip was in 2011. Yep. Was it back then? Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. And yep. that was our first 10 <clears throat> animals that came back and came to you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember a couple of them. There was one mount for that's that's why I, I'd said that. Like yeah. The, yeah. The the uh, mountain reed buck. Yes. Yeah. There, there's one look. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, that's like that's one form. You know, that just hasn't expanded. No. Well, there's not 
that many people that go to Africa looking to hunt a mountain reed buck. Like there's usually the staples like the kudu. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't think of it. Of the like sable, what, the roan. Yeah. yeah. I suppose. But I mean, when you think about the the ones where they all come in a package. Oh, yeah. Um, you're gonna, it's going to be a springbok. Yeah, yeah. springbok, wildebeest, impala, impala, and a, and a and kudu warthog, yeah. and a warthog. Yeah, yeah. probably and, my least favorite to do. Yeah, and but she, you did a really she, nice <laughs> sitting one of mine. My 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 little pumba. Well, he's not very little. He's actually a really nice yeah. Yeah. warthog. But yeah, there he is. Kind he of was sure a hairy guy. That uh, was yeah. part of the reason why I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> he was the hairiest warthog warthog I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, he lots of hair all over him. Hmm. Yeah, we do probably 35, 40% of what we do is exotics, like Africa, New Zealand. Yeah. Um, we got you know, we got some stuff here from Kyrgyzstan and, and stuff like that. So Yeah. Um, just something I took an interest in and a little bit more diverse. Um, well, it's, it, um, it's great to be known as being really good for something like whitetail or bear or yep. canines or what have you, but... It's also nice for you to to step out of a comfort zone and learn something new or yep. or try something different, right? I was so. I was lucky enough with that too, where um, on the one uh, taxidermy site, the the United Taxidermy Association was doing a fundraiser auction, and it was for uh, uh, a workshop with a guy in Texas, right? And uh, he was a world champion, national champion guy with African. Oh. And I just, I had to win that. <laughs> so I just kept bidding. <laughs> and uh, So did you win it or did you win I it did. with your visa card? <laughs> I guess I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Define win. Yeah. Was it a ticket or was it? He came yeah. in first place. He came yeah. in first place. I got <laughs> determined to be first. <laughs> no, so I went and did that. and uh, Probably that was, a really valuable education. Yep. And yeah. he was very smart on the business end of it. Yes. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is how much business is behind the taxidermy. Yes. It's not just mounting animals. Right. Well, there's, that's the, there's a business behind it. And, yes. And, and that's the tough part because as a taxidermist, you have to be creative. Creatives aren't usually very organized. And creative. <laughs> well, that's where Jen yeah. comes in. Yes, my wife comes in. Yes. Yeah. And creatives aren't really good at the business side of it. So for, for somebody to, to, to give you, you know, pertinent advice on, on the business end of it, that's a heck of a, of a bonus. Yeah. I guess for me, um, I, you know, I, I did it part-time, and I worked in the oil patch too, right? Right. And uh, the business slowly was gaining ground. And I was just determined to get out of the oil patch. Right. You know, I'd had enough of listening to someone tell me what to do. And whether yeah. I agreed with it or not, we had to do it. You right, know? right, right. Yeah. And I guess maybe it's stubbornness. <laughs> oh, a lot of us are just born to be our own bosses. And and I was, you know, so the reason I basically stuck with it, I was determined not to go back to the oil patch. Right. You know, and not that it's bad. It's just... It come to a point where it just wasn't for me anymore. Right. You know, it, it paid me well, and and it we we got to where we are because of where I worked in Oil Patch. But yep. it just got to a point was enough's enough. Now we need yeah. to expand and and expand our our brains basically, mm -hmm. you know, and make this thing go. Yeah. So I quit the Oil Patch in 2013. Right. And just determined to go forward. <laughs> to go forward and. When we talk about um, taxidermy, I mean, one of the most important things is the, is the cape that you're handed. Mm -hmm. um, is there any place that does an especially outstanding bad job or good job, or is it hit and miss no matter where you are? As are far you talking I, about tanning? When we you no, know, when you talk about the cape that he ends up getting and then he has oh. to tan. Are you talking when we get it from the client? Yes. Um. Well, there's lots of bad care. Yeah. Yep. Um, I I don't I don't know how there's the disconnect. Um, you know, you, you shoot the animal, and you're so determined to not let that meat rot, right? Yeah. You know, you'll pack it for days on your back out of the mountains. Right. And and there is a mindset that, you know, that that hide won't rot. You know. Oh what I mean? really? 
Yeah. So, so, so people you know, taking care of their own hides are doing a bad job. Well, not everybody. I should, you know, there's guys that are, that go over the top looking after them. You know, mm. they do a good job, but, but, you know, for example, like we always tell people, um, a lot of stories, a guy on phone, uh, I shot a deer, uh, four days ago. Well, where is it? Well, it's been on a cool shop floor, you know? Oh dear. And, and so you're thinking, oh man, like, you know, but you wouldn't let your meat lay on the cool shop floor for four days. No, you know, and it's, it's flesh, it's meat, it's yeah. going to yeah. decay. Yeah. yeah. And so, so it's, it's, I don't know how you can get that mindset that the, the hide is just as important as, as the meat. Right? Well, a few years ago, uh, I guess it was when you and Jen came and hunted at our place for elk. Mm -hmm. Um, you <clears> did <throat> just a little quick tip that we had put on one of our shows, um, about how to if if you've shot a bear yeah. how to make sure that you're not going to lose the the head mm -hmm. to rot because yeah. that's what happens with a lot of people they bury the head yeah. inside the rest of the of the yeah. hide right yeah. so it was a really good thing and we got a lot of feedback on that yeah. it was like wow i didn't know that there was a you know a, a technique that would be really important and and we just had this conversation with a friend of ours yep. Yep. on the way back it was a long weekend in september and we'd gone up to to do some work at the cabin and on the way back kenny calls and he yep. said you know we got a big deer out on the property and my daughter's got a tag and and you know we're just and he wanted a little bit of advice and we said but if you if you shoot it don't wrap the head up inside yeah. the hide. I, I told him to take it to, to the back of the yeah. head, leave the head in because the taxidermist is going to want to, yes. is going to want to do the head himself. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That, that like the head, I mean, of course it's body temperature, right? Yep. Yes. And when you take the hide off the rest of the body, well, the rest of the skin's cooling down, yes. especially like a bear. Yes. And you see it more times than not the head and the paws. Okay. They're left in. Right. And then they're rolled up like a sleeping bag. Yes. Well, that hair acts as an insulator. Yes. It's not going to let that hide cool down. It's going to get to decay before yes. the coolness gets to it. Right. right. And that's why it's like, don't put it on the inside of the hide. Leave it out. Well, yeah. it was really cool when you showed us. I mean, you you you, you stretched it out and then and then you took and folded it in such a way is that the the last thing was was the head and the paws were on the top on the outside and you yep. said you really want this because it's when it's a frozen lump you can just tie one of those paws up on the uh, uh, up in your shop and let it, and, and as it thaws, it all unfurls and, and, and comes down, right? Yep. But that the head freezes first and and, and, and thaws the paws first. do yep. too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, and that same thing. If you think about it, it, if it's wrapped inside, that head's the last thing to freeze. Yeah, yeah. And and, 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 and then and when you take it out to thaw, the outside of that hide is. We've had some that are three days where the outside has been thawed, and the head still froze. Right. right? You know, so the thawed part will flesh it salt it flesh it salt it but yeah you know where well, is when it? it's in a shop it's you know what you're doing with it yeah. once it gets here but so then is there something that people with it because deer is obviously very popular around here mm -hmm. and throughout i would say north america that's one of the one of the top animals that that probably comes to a taxidermist mm -hmm. shop so is there something that you would recommend that that you've seen that people do or don't do that's a, a pretty quick tip that they might be able to, I other just, than don't leave it on a shop floor for four days. I, I really <laughs> think that you should actually pre-plan your, I mean, especially like around here, you never mm -hmm. know. You're, you could shoot a deer of a lifetime. Yes. You should have it, it planned out like before, okay, what am I going to do if I get it? Where right. am I going to hang it? You know? Yes. Stuff like that. And, and We'll field those calls. Like, yes. What should I do with this thing? Stuff like that. So I, I shot but, it. It's on the ground. <laughs> where where we, I guess here, we're fortunate in a way. Our deer season, most of the deer are shot in November. Right. When it's freezing. Yeah. So you don't really have to worry about it getting to rot. Mm -hmm. It's going to be froze some days before you even get home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, true. But, you know, in the same... And then, but sometimes that mindset follows into bear season and, you know, like here in deer season, well, you got a bit of time yeah, because it's going to freeze, but you know, 
And so if you have that mindset in spring, you know, your barrel rot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, we've got, um, up in our area, we have, or probably could draw a mule deer tag. Um, and it, and we can have some warm days in September when those mm-hmm. tags are, when they come out. So you don't have the, it's likely not going to freeze in September. Yeah. Um, so just making sure that you get the hide looked after and, and probably that you get, if, if you're going to take it to a <laughs> taxidermist, I suppose that you'd probably want to freeze yeah. the hide in the head, but not wrap the head in the hide similar to the yeah. bear. Yeah, yeah, but then it comes back to the pre-planning. Yes. You know, well, do we have enough freezer room to put this yeah. d- head and rack in? Well, yeah, but that's funny. I'm sitting here as you're saying that, thinking about all the guys that have the you know the Sitka gear and the, and the Loa boots and the and the proper ammo and the proper you know camo, all that kind of stuff, and yet they don't think about what what if I do shoot the deer of a lifetime? I mean, chances are they're going to shoot another 130 or, yeah. or 140 or whatever. But, but what if the, there is the possibility that absolutely. you're going to run across a we, good one, right? We had it this fall. Yes. Um, some guys went on a hunt of a lifetime. And they each got the animals they went for, and they didn't take salt. And they're, no. in, the, and they're in the back country. Oh, no. And they, they thought they could just air dry these hides down and... and they were uh, take it bighorn or, or uh it was uh for caribou oh for caribou okay yeah and and but when you look back at it you know they were they were charting a float plane in mm-hmm. so they had weight restrictions right. so salt wasn't a priority right. you know what i mean it went, yeah okay and i mean i guess so i've been on those hunts where you're how, you're, how you're much res- salt should you take you know, on something like that, you probably could have got away with five to seven pounds. You know, just enough to to help out. So something this size, five to seven pounds. You I, like if I had unlimited amounts of salt here at the shop, I would probably use ten to yeah. fifteen, right? But we're... but if I'm going on a hunt like that, you you can get away with it, and it all depends. I mean, you know, in Africa, I would use more salt yeah. than mm-hmm. than here at home, and when it's freezing at night. So right. Um. Yeah, just a little bit of pre-planning. So I'm bighorn hunting with Sandy, and she shoots a bighorn. The I most important thing: get that hide off as quick as I can. Yep. Take take the take the head out. If if you're comfortable doing that, right? So that that's the exact example happened with some some of our clients this year. He was going on a bighorn hunt, and he called me. What do I do? You know, and of course, you know, bighorns aren't easy to come by as far as nope you know so um he called what do i do and i you know how much salt do we need to take and okay and they did each get a big horn yeah but in it you know but he called been, you <laughs> yeah you know and and it's just a five minute phone call and, yeah. and if you don't know how to take the head out you know pop by the shop sometime yeah we can quickly show you yeah and and when you're in the back you know if you think you know where you've you've sheep hunted You've hiked a long ways in there. Yep. <laughs> and you got a long walk back out. But if you know how to take that hide off yep. and you know how to deal with it with salt, you don't have to rush out. Now your meat is your concern, right? Yep. Where, where at least the hide's looked after. Right. Stuff like that. So, I mean, no one goes out knowing they're going to have something to mount at the end of the day, but it's good to know how to deal with it. Yeah. So how far should they go? I mean, it's I mean, it's obviously as far as as they're comfortable with. But suppose they're comfortable doing a decent job keeping the the, the skull out. Do you want to see the lips split? You want to see salt in the nose and the, and the ears or what? what? Well, there, you can get away. Uh, I mean, you can the lips split and stuff. You should do it. Yeah. If you can't get that done, I mean, we can fight with that. Um, but the ears need to be turned. Okay. You need to turn the ears. There's, I mean, that salt needs to touch the skin. Right. So if the salt can't get to the skin and, and you do kind of a, uh, a decent job turning the nose and the lips and you pour salt on the hide, it doesn't matter because if those ears aren't, if those ears don't have the salt, they're right. going to slip. So now you've got this really good hide with bald ears. 
<laughs> you know. So. <laughs> Not a good look. Yeah. <laughs> so be be prepared and be planned. Yeah. Well, I think that's very good advice, right? Because you you think about as you said all the all the gear, all the the techie stuff of yeah. The, oh, yeah. the scope, the the ammo, the the mm-hmm. gun, the camo, all of that. But if you don't take the cheapest part of the trip, salt, <laughs> yeah. then, yeah. Salt then is what, yeah. you know, then, I mean, you, you're still going to have the memories, but you're not going to have the hide. Yeah. Pe- people argue about, well, that scope weighs 22 ounces. This one weighs 18 ounces. Well, I got news <laughs> for you. You need seven pounds of salt, too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that 20 cents a pound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that, that is the least you're ever going to pay for, for the more work, I, t- I tell you. You had have to have seen some disasters, as far as hide care. Oh yeah, like you, you there must have been stuff that, <laughs> that that came in here or or before you thought it or after after it got tanned or whatever, and you went, oh my god, what happened? Yeah, we I can remember one bear a, a guy had shot, you know, and of course evening is prime time for bear hunting. Mm-hmm. Yep, shot it and left it overnight. You know, we'll find it in the morning. They found it in the morning. And it was hot, like plus twenty five type. And put it in the back of the truck. Didn't gut it, didn't skin it, nothing. We'll br- oh. oof. we'll just bring it to your hole. You oof. know, and, and from the time he shot it, the time he got it here was twenty four hours. Uh huh. And all he had to do was back up and you could smell it. Oh. Uh, and know, then it's like don't even bother. We'll just, There's nothing we the can do. The only thing you can have is a as a Euro. Skull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um lots of times in the downside to our deer freezing is they get thrown in the back of the truck and then they freeze to the truck box. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and then and then you look out the window and they back up and they're yanking on it, pulling Ooh. it out. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they pull it and there's a patch of hair stuck to the frozen so, truck box. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard and I have hunted antelope before. And yeah. <laughs> we, we always joke about this one time because... I know where you're going yeah. with this one. <laughs> We didn't bring any poly with us. For whatever reason. Yeah, for, yeah. I mean, who leaves just... home without a, with, without a tarp or poly? <laughs> I did once. Well, we did. And so then we went to Walmart looking, because we were in a small community, but there was a Walmart there. And so we you were looking for some polythene, but they didn't. Or... So hmm. we wrapped the body in a shower curtain. <laughs> 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 Skinned out the antelope because antelope, you have to get that hide off right away for the meat to be edible. It wasn't anything we were mounting or anything like that. But it, they, then you had to you had to take in and uh, protect that meat. Well, we couldn't find polythene or anything else. We, I think the shower curtain had little fishes and starfish or something on I it. I don't know what it had, but it was <laughs> like we felt like Goomba yeah. wrapping a body in a shower curtain. Yeah, in, a park, in the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> and we were wondering who was going to drive by or who was going to report <laughs> us to the police, or, and nobody ever did, of course. But yeah. Hello, puss puss. <laughs> you had, were telling me, though, you had a, a unique situation where, you know, your the hides come to you and they're like iron. Yep. Dried and, and the the their folded hair in and I you send them off the tannery they come back and and half of it has slipped. Yep. What do you do in those situations? First, call the customer. <laughs> you know, I guess so, yeah. right? That partic- yeah. Sometimes you know, it's not our fault. You know right. what I mean? Like they come from overseas or something, and yeah. and uh, I find there's one country that's really bad with uh, hide care and getting animals out of the country. And so they sit there a long time. And who's that? It's, it's in Argentina. Argentina's the worst. Yeah. They're permitting the government, I find, is, you know, we just sent a black buck home with a guy. It took him two and a half years to get it home. What? Yep. And that wow. was because, uh, you know, he was tr- getting it crated with his friend. So his friend got the permits, you know, they, his permits. But his permits were just slow. All right. So when his permits finally came... His friends had expired. Right. Stuff like oh. that, right? And so, it, it, you know, the hides had sat in, damps, it, in damp conditions and, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, what do you do? I mean, he shot, like, for example, his black buck had hair missing on the bridge of the nose. and <laughs> The cat, I can, he- I can hear it. <laughs> well, it, it, for whatever reason, it likes, it wants to rub up against my mic. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so we do the best we can. You know, we we either we can try and paint it. You know, or uh, a couple of the African ones we electroflocked the you know on the face. Right. That's short hair. Yeah. So we electroflocked it yeah. and uh, repainted it, and, and uh, you couldn't tell really once you know once the guy get it up on his wall and in amongst the other animals i mean you could point it out and say well this is where it was flocked and you can go yeah i can see that but just for the untrained eye you wouldn't know so you try your best to fix them right because what what do you do the the animal come from overseas and right and it's just like you can't get one next week in the mail no, no, we were lucky. We had a, a, a full tar hide slip on us, but it slipped before it ever left uh, New Zealand. They discovered mm-hmm. it when they, when they went to uh, expedite, right? And uh, that, was, that was lucky because otherwise we'd ended up with a tar yep. hide that what do you do, right? Yep. So they, they, they got another one for us. That, that was uh, very fortunate. But yeah, it's got to be a nightmare to have stuff come back from the tanner and you, and, you know, you can see where it slipped and everything, right? Yep, yep. What was your biggest challenge to do? What mount was your biggest challenge? Uh, we've we've done some big mounts like that. I would say the challenge would be um, just having it turn out. Right. Right. You know, so the, the double cougar and mule deer piece and have it suspended. You know, the, the, it's got a balance so it don't fall over. It's got a balance to make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So those are challenges. Um, they just take time. And it's just the challenge, I guess, would be having the patience to let it, you know, the patience to work knowing it that it's going to take some time. Yeah. So, you know, you're on day eight of 15 day piece and you're like, uh, you know, I hope on day 15, this looks decent. Yeah. <laughs> it's that challenge of just keeping at it. Right. So well, it's a mental game too. It's right? a huge mental yeah. game. Right. It's there's, there's burnout in, in the tax term industry. Guys get burnt out Yeah. and it's just. Just constant focus, right? Well, I know we were at uh, a taxidermy shop that in uh, Africa, in South Africa, and they, they were just doing our expediting, right? Mm-hmm. They, they were going to, or pardon, they were just doing the salt and tan, weren't they? The dip and pack. The dip and pack, yeah. And uh, anyway, it was it was like it was uh, bush buck day while we were there, <laughs> and there was about twenty guys standing in a circle, and they had twenty bush bucks on the go at once. One guy did the left eye and moved to the next one, did the left eye, and then the other guy did the right eye. And, you know, it's like, so <laughs> depending but on their ability. But they all the same. Yeah, they, they did. So if they were all, the eyes were this way, they, they, it was on all of them, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't know. They all look the same to me. They look good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's where the artist part of it really comes into it, right? And why yeah. we've never, uh, and and there's lots of people that would disagree with us, and, and maybe they've had different experiences with with taxidermy shops in in foreign countries but but for us it's always been about the individuality of the artist right and and when you like someone's work and you know you can count on them and that they're going to be honest with you and and you know and give you some good advice like that's not going to look good don't be silly (laughs) or stupid yeah (laughs) well and uh, for a lot of things so i mean like for a white-tailed deer just about anybody can do a nice technical white tail deer. And that everybody's going to say, oh, that looks nice, right? Where you're going to see the talent show is the canines and the felines, yep. the mm-hmm. dogs and cats. And then, you know, and the reason being is because we look at them every day. Yep. You, you watch how, how that cat right there, how, how it looks and, and the attention it pays and all that. You can see that transformed onto the bobcat <laughs> over there or the cougar, the lynx, right? Yeah. That's the way it should look. So when, when they're stiff or, or look unnatural, we pick up on it. But, that's why he gets to be in the shop sometimes because he he can be referenced, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, just the way he lays. That's you know, probably you the know, nicest thing you ever called him was reference. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that no. should be his name instead of Mister Whiskers. <laughs> yeah. We just call him reference. <laughs> but yeah, no, and I I've explained it to people like you can have a, a two hundred inch white tail, yeah. and you could put red eyes in him. People first thing people look at is a rack. Yeah. 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 When you go to a canine or a or a, a like a cat, eyeballs are the first thing you look at because there's nothing else to look at yeah. unless yeah. it's like a leopard, the spots and stuff. But yeah, you know, every, it, 
your eyes are the first thing they focus on. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, I think that's where, where those cat, like the cats and dogs get critiqued a lot harder. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've we seen, know. Yeah. We yeah. know. How and that's looks. all, that's where the mount is. It's in the eyeballs on, yeah. on those animals. Yeah. And even here in this area, maybe not so much here, but at home where we have a lot of bear, mm-hmm. you, I mean, you, you get to know what a, how a bear moves, how, mm-hmm. it, how its feet move when it walks, how, you know, how it holds its head or, or whatever, but yeah. <laughs> you better come here before you step on something and turn something off. Yeah. <laughs> but the neat part is, is I just, I, I watch this cat laying on her lap and watch how it's, it's paws curve and flex and all that. And it all shows what it's doing, what yep. it's thinking, right? Yep. And I, it, it's that's just not always flat footed. No, 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 no it's <laughs> yeah. not, you know? Yeah. Or the way he sits and yeah. you can see how, how high up his, his, his knee joint comes up onto his body. Right. Yeah. You know, he's just a house cat We're, we won't mount him, but, <laughs> but I mean, you well, can, but his mannerisms are very similar though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes he'll, you know, if the dog walks by, he'll get all in a crouch position to, yeah. to attack him and. Yeah, but you know? that's a cougar or a but bobcat you, or, or whatever. You just watch the tail, you know. Yeah, yeah. the tail can go two different directions. Yeah. You know, the base can be pointing that way, the tips that way at the end, and you that's know right. stuff like that. And so, so, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> well, I have really enjoyed this, yeah. and uh, I've uh, I've enjoyed being here hunting. Uh, <laughs> and, and you I, know what? I think that's the the best part of about what we do is getting. To be with friends. Yep. Yeah. 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 A connection that never, never goes away, but we, we sometimes have to strengthen it by being face to face a little bit more often. <laughs> I mean, we were talking about that this morning when we ran into those two groups of hunters that yeah. were just happy that you had got your moose. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I think, what. I think that's what me... ties us all together as yeah. a hunting community or <laughs> trapping or whatever. Oh, he's going <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> Doug India. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Whiskers, <laughs> we might yeah. see what size form you fit on. <laughs> 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 uh, all right, buddy. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Curtis. Thanks for coming down. It's been a real pleasure, as always. <laughs> <laughs>